existing vulnerabilities at the individual, community, and institutional level. While climate change is impacting communities everywhere, resilience and the ability to stay safe are not the same for all. Without protective actions based on a proper understanding of the context, women, children, persons with disabilities, uh, the elderly and other minority groups are often particularly in danger of being impacted, risking displacement, trafficking, economic hardship, among others. We know that as protection actors, we must see ourselves as front and center in terms of understanding how climate change and disasters are shaping the realities of those we work with and the related responses needed to strengthen rights and advance solutions in accordance with international law. It's important that we as a sector, as humanitarian professionals, as protection personnel are able to play our part proactively, not just reactively, and in advance in responding to the challenges faced and in ensuring that protection concerns are recognized and appropriately dealt with. Here we know that this guidance around preparedness actions in the context of climate change and disasters is about starting that process now. We know the cycles repeat themselves in many contexts. We know that the awareness and the interplay between climate uh, and humanitarian crises, whether it be conflict, violence, are all interrelated and that awareness level, the planning, uh, the application of our uh, of our responses and catering them uh, to those types of issues is needed now, uh, not just for today, but also for tomorrow. This will help us translate and concretize our approaches, particularly in terms of a no regrets basis as well. From June to December of 2021, the Glo uh, Global Protection Cluster consulted field protection clusters on their preparedness efforts in the context of climate change and disasters. Following these consultations, guidance on climate change and disasters and an accompanying toolkit uh, were produced and shared. Um, these documents are intended uh, to supplement and contribute to other guidance related to disaster response and risk reduction by outlining key protection uh, concerns and issues. Today, in this room and also across the world for all those participating online, we intend to briefly outline the scope and context uh, of the guidance and toolkit. Uh, we'll then have some interventions from two of our colleagues based in Mozambique and South Sudan who, have, who will outline challenges and issues uh, faced in their context and how they and the wider humanitarian team have responded to them. We'll then have time for a discussion among those uh, who are with us in the room. And also, again, thanks to all those joining us online. So without further ado, I will uh, hand it back to Nancy for facilitation. Thanks, Sam, so much for those opening words. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Graham Carrington is our consultant with the GPC, the Global Protection Cluster. He's worked with other colleagues in the GPC to hold consultations about and then develop our guidance and toolkit on protection preparedness in the context of climate change and disasters. He's also been involved in our rollout um, to in the region, uh, both in East Africa and also recently in the Middle East. With an original background in public health, he has worked in both humanitarian assistance and development for over 20 years, including on issues related to disaster preparedness in the Caribbean and issues related to drought conflict response and recovery in East Africa in particular. So over to you, Graham, thanks. Yes, thank you, Nancy, and uh, good afternoon or evening wherever people are. Um, so I'm going to just spend a few minutes going through what I'm going to talk about a little bit is what's in the guidance copies of which have circulated to people here, but which are available online, and we'll put the link up in the chat. Uh, so start to start off really just to think, well, climate change and disasters. Um, next slide, please. Uh, sorry. Um, you know, what are the protection impacts and concerns? Within the guidance, we've, we've addressed this in a number of ways. We started, uh, next slide, please. We started with definitions. Um, and just to, I'm not going to read all of them out, but just to go through them, I think we all recognize that defining things, we all think it's obvious, but sometimes there is a need to make sure we're speaking a common language. So within the guidance, the, the definition for climate change that we've used is the one that's used by the UN framework and the Convention on Climate Change. Um, you know, and it's perhaps important to state that because climate change in other contexts can mean all sorts of different things. And then obviously when we spot start talking about natural hazards 
we, we've, we've, we've spoken about a hazard and there's been there's a lot of debate when we were developing the guidance about at what point we should or shouldn't call a natural hazard a natural disaster uh, with quite a lot of people unhappy with increasingly unhappy with the term natural disaster so we've defined defined hazard um you know as a process of a phenomenon that, that can cause a loss of life or injury but but often is you know if it does so it's it's, it's a failure in response it's a failure to prepare or a failure to respond although um i think we can all agree that if some events for example the indian ocean tsunami whatever would have been done preparedness you know there would have been terrible impacts but you know this discussion around a hazard and a disaster are quite complicated next slide please and for throughout the guidance we've used the definition of a disaster as, as the one defined by the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction um, as a serious disruption, et cetera. And I think that's, you know, that's quite an important, uh, important one to use. And we recognize that there's an interaction with exposure to vulnerability and capacity. You know, and that's when we start talking about a disaster event. For protection, um, unsurprisingly, I think people would find we've used the Interagency Standing Committee's definition uh, for protection. So it is quite clear what we're talking about um and you know it sort of uh, is based based within international human rights law humanitarian law and, and refugee law as well by definition so that's the one we've used throughout the guidance in that context uh next slide please when i when i looked at this uh, even though i've been kind of around kind of humanitarian development work for many years um and i thought i kind of understood the the impact of, of natural hazards and disasters um, uh, this, this, is a, this is a graphic, and it's a bit old now, but it's taken from the IDMC's 2020 report. I was, I was still very surprised by this. The blue circles basically represent uh, the, the number of people that were impacted by what you might loosely just call natural hazards, which became natural disasters, uh, with a large number of them being weather-related events. They're the blue circles. And the, the orange, kind of more conflict, conflicts in what we traditionally kind of think of in terms of complex emergencies. And in that period, out of 40.5 million new displacements, 30.7 million were related to non-conflict events, of which 30 million were weather related. I was really surprised when I saw that. I think we have to note that possibly quite a lot of that displacement was temporary, was quite temporary in nature is it may, may well have been to do with some of the, I think that year in particular, there were some very large tropical cyclones, but it's still quite a shocking statistic. And I think it's a growing statistic and it does highlight the growing challenge that I think we're faced with as we start looking at climate change related events and issues. Um, next slide, please. So this other graphic, just to explain, I mean, we, I think we all know, but interrelated factors exacerbate risk um, when, we, when we start looking at hazards. And this is, this is just taken from our World Bank, particular World Bank uh, report on small island states. But I think it shows, quite graphically shows the important understandings that we need to have around the interaction between risk, uh, vulnerability to a natural hazard, and, and also exposure. And then the sort of compounding factors where you've got issues related to poverty, You've got climate change as an accelerator, um, and then you've also got poorly planned development. And I think we can all think of examples of where that you know those factors kind of working together exacerbate risk. And we try to explore that in the guidance in a very practical way, in terms of pe taking people through how to maybe think around some of those issues. Uh, next slide, please. So let's just think through some of the protection concerns and issues. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll put all of them up, Tim, thank you. Um, I think we know this, but it's important to remember, you know, issues that we all deal with at the field level are multifaceted and complex. Uh, there's a, you know, hazards have got a very complex nature and they often result in increased protection risks and compound existing vulnerabilities. So for example, somebody displaced due to drought just take an example in somalia may well moving into town moving into a town 
may well then be living on marginal land, which becomes vulnerable, particularly vulnerable to floods when they occur. So, you know, I think we all know that kind of existing risk can compound vulnerabilities. So very often we are seeing, in a sense, the people that we usually see affected, we are seeing them particularly affected. But I think it's important to remember when we're looking at some of these issues, we rightly worry about the displaced, but perhaps we also, I think, also need to recognize that there's groups of people that sometimes cannot move for a variety of reasons. I mean, I think we can think about disability, people who are very elderly, but also maybe particular groups that can't move because of other tensions in a community, which mean that their options become very limited. Um, so just even uh, displacement it may, may, be, may be a big problem for them. Increasingly, we're seeing relationships with conflict and insecurity dynamics in many contexts, I think particularly of the Sahel again, where we're seeing people dropping out of livelihoods, for example, young men dropping out of pastoralist livelihoods or agriculturally farming ones, being more vulnerable, arguably, more vulnerable to recruitment by armed groups. And that creates its own dynamic and is, is a major risk. And I think that the, the response to that is something we need to all be very aware of, but also the concerns we have about the, resp the response to that sometimes becoming over over securitized as well. And that's a challenge, I think, for both humanitarian and development actors. One of the things we do raise in the guidance is the issue around changing profiles of vulnerability. I mean, like I said, we, we are looking in many cases at people that we normally think of as being vulnerable, being having increased vulnerability. But so in some cases, there's new groups, new communities being affected. Think of the Pacific Islands. You know, they're perhaps groups that you know, groups being affected by climate change and, and, and people suffering tropical cyclones that we didn't we didn't see before and weren't at risk, and that's bringing dynamics. But also then just to, to say that, you know, throughout the guidance, we talk about the importance and the value of preparedness in terms of response to protection challenges and concerns. You know, there's things that can be done to mitigate and things that can be done to prepare for some events, to make sure that some of the main protection risks that we see are not, uh, are not felt in the same way. Uh, next slide, please. So just very quickly, I mean, Sam and Nancy, well, Sam particularly mentioned this. So why guidance and, and what guidance? Um, next slide, please. That the, you know, the cluster, you know, felt that there was a need to write this particular guidance was, again, as we've mentioned, recognition of the growing challenges across all countries and regions. I think all the teams that uh, are interacted with are recognizing the, the problems and the challenges. It wasn't the intention to replicate all the very excellent guidance. There's lots of guidance, as you all know, out there, particularly from some of our DRR colleagues who have done a lot of work. And, you know, I think even in our guidance, we flag, flagged some of those other resources. But there was a perceived need to do some, some very practical raising of profiles on issues related to protection. And we'll hear more from colleagues in a, in a few minutes about that. Also, just to, to flag that, you know, the issues around the impact of rapid onset hazards are often highlighted, but perhaps, although perhaps increasingly we do, humanitarians have perhaps sometimes been a bit slower to recognize slow impact, slow impact issues. When we get an acute exacerbation of, of vulnerability in a drought, for example, I think that becomes something that requires a humanitarian response. But sometimes communities year on year, bit by bit, you know, it, it, Good traditionally are recognizing some of those kind of issues. Again, to flag understanding of context is key to understanding groups that may have protection needs. So again, throughout the guidance, we flag the importance of local partnerships and localization, localization efforts and issues, recognizing that that's, you know, if we're going to have proper protection responses, it needs to be based on Of exacerbation factor, the fact that these these issues you know do tend to play on each other, and they they multiple 
when we when we talk to groups about the guidance, it was seen as potentially important and useful. But one of the things that was fed back to us very clearly was the need for it to be practical and compact. So that's why what you find in front of you is not too difficult to read. It is deliberately simple, straightforward, and quite 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 a lot based on issues related to things like checklists or pointing people to checklists um, where they can where they can sort of basically have issues to, to to consider and to think about in that in that sense. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, the development process for the guidance um, is that we, when we did it, I mean, some of you, some of the online people, certainly, some of, some of you may have been consulted. Um, we had a series of bilateral calls um, with people in over 14 countries, as well as at the global level. Some of those were sector specialists, some of our UNDRR colleagues and, and people from other agencies involved in DRR, as well as protection specialists. We also set up a series of regional calls with the field protection clusters. And I think we had, I think we had probably over 100 people participating in those um, from the Pacific all the way to across to Latin America, through Africa and Asia. And obviously we did quite a lot of work on looking at background and documentation, uh, country level documents, as well as some of the policy, some of the over, overarching policy frameworks related to both protection and, and DRR. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what's in the guidance, as you'll see, as I said, we spent quite a bit of time looking at definitions, recognizing that those are important so that people could speak a common language. We tried to balance overall scope versus detail and points of emphasis. The guy, the, you know, the feedback we strongly got was the need for something to be you know, concise, clear, not too long, and then you know, focused on having a toolkit approach which people could dip into. So that's why we didn't we didn't make the scope too broad and we didn't we didn't make it too long. Um, people particularly wanted to see context and you know the importance of context analysis. So we did throughout the guidance try to make use of examples, particular examples to illustrate points. And within uh, within the toolkit, you'll also find more country analysis and country examples. Issues around localization and partnership were stressed to us around the need to make sure that that was emphasized. Um, we've translated the guidance so far, I think it's in, into Spanish and French as well as English, but there have been calls to do to do more. Um, I think there's always a, a balance to achieve there. I mean, I think we tried to make the toolkit something which most of the documents, for example, are online, they're all online, but most of them are in, deliberately put in Word or in, or in a software which can be manipulated with the intention that the end user can use them to develop their own their own materials or their own course based in their own own language or context. Um, we we highlight issues related to synergies with conflict issues um, and also the multipliers. And we've also tried to stress the work across humanitarian peace development nexus and the integration. I think we all see that, and I think particularly with climate change, that that becomes very clear that there isn't a kind of develop there can't be a development in humanitarian. Um, they, they have, you know, they, they, they can't be walls, they have to be links and, and connectors. I think perhaps usefully, increasingly, some of the climate finance instruments which we're seeing developed are helping, or at least in theory, should help to bridge some of those, some of those, uh, some of those divides, but we'll, we'll see. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to very quickly just, just flag the areas of focus, which you'll find in the guidance, um, conscious of time, so I won't go through them all, but they're there to see. We do talk about the responsibility of the state, obviously to flag that as a, as a clear issue, but also to flag to, to humanitarians the importance of being willing, obviously in an appropriate context, being prepared to work with local partners and national governments. It's sometimes easier to do that in response to a natural hazard or shock than it might be in some of the conflict situations that we work with. And sometimes in doing so in an appropriate way, it can even maybe build bridges for other things to happen. And I mean, that's, you know, I think we all know some of the wider examples where natural, natural hazards have ended up being something which has led to discussions, 
um, and you know, with you know, with with actors that perhaps people find difficult to work with. Um, we talk about the importance of context analysis and preparedness, and that's uh, that's flagged in a number of ways. And you know, again, there's a, there's a series of checklists available in the toolkit related to that. The issue related to age, gender, and diversity. There's a lot of colleagues working on those issues, and again, we we try to make links. Um, do no harm is stressed, as you won't be surprised. Um, you know, it's widely used in obviously in both humanitarian and development programming. Um, but I think it's primarily, primarily been often used in situations where conflict and security are key challenges. Um, but perhaps it's also, you know, important to remember that do no harm in response to in response to preparing for natural hazards is equally important. And I think of some of the things I was once involved in around, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the importance of thinking about if you're going to have to create temporary shelters to think about all the issues related to that before they happen around how do you make sure that the people manning the shelters you know are, are, are appropriate people to do so how do you make sure that women children and other minorities are safe in such in such environments i think we can think of lots of examples where that's been a quite significant problem and then again we talk about work across the hbdn and we also you know go through a little bit about how people might uh, try and establish priorities, recognizing that that's a significant challenge, um, but one that we all have to do, including in response uh, to these issues. So as a quick tour through the guidance or a quick run through what people can expect to find, um, but I hope people, you know, people get the chance to look at it in more detail, either here or online. And again, we will put up the link to it and we'll talk about it later. I think we've already done it. Thank you, Tim. I'll hand back to uh, hand back to Nancy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. Thanks for that overview of our guidance in the toolkit. Um, Graham has been an essential part of uh, the work uh, with the GPC on on our guidance. So now, I'm going to now give a quick introduction to Hugo Reichenberger. Um, Hugo is a senior protection cluster coordinator in Mozambique. He's based in Maputo at the national level. He's been working closely with national authorities within Mozambique, especially the National Institute for Disaster Risk Reduction, as well as other protection cluster partners. And OCHA to ensure protection is at the center of the cyclone and the rainy season response. The protection cluster in Mozambique has been actively supporting and developing a number of practical tools <clears throat> to ensure protection is mainstreamed during preparedness and response to the cyclone season including protection sensitive evacuation simulations, protection early warning messages, protection checklists to mitigate and reduce protection risks in ev evacuation centers. And Hugo has previously worked in Ukraine, Myanmar, Chad, Central African Republic, Burkina Faso, Algeria, Brazil, and in Geneva. So without further ado, over to you, Hugo. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nancy, for the introduction. Thank you very much, Graham, and also Sam. Um, with your opening remarks. Uh, so, dear colleagues, uh, welcome uh, to Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique, as Sam was mentioning, um, disasters do compound protection um, risks. And of course, this is the case for Mozambique. I'm glad there's a map there over, and you can see the flag of Mozambique also on that map. Um, Mozambique is actually very, um, extremely vulnerable to, to climate shocks. It has a 2,400, than 30 kilometer coast. And unfortunately, most of the population is concentrated along that coast. And what we've been seeing in the last uh, years, I think you've all heard of uh, Cyclone Idai. Um, and since Cyclone Idai, we've had cyclones hit the Mozambican coast um, on a yearly basis. So. We mentioned, of course, Idai as a disaster in itself. It was a cyclone of um, historical catastrophic proportions for the African continent. And yes, Africa does get hit by cyclones. I often get that uh, people are surprised by that. But Cyclone Idai has been a, a disaster in it that it welcomed a series of cyclones. Um, it really was a start of us seeing cyclones on a yearly ba basis and no longer with, a, with, with the years or um, of gaps between them. Maybe the next slide, uh, Graham or Nancy. And you can click the next. 
So as I was saying, we have, of course, a country that is very, um, actually the previous slide, yeah, yeah. So very, very uh, vulnerable to, to climate shocks. And um, what we've seen this year was a particularly um, strange and uh, phenomenon, which was Cyclone Freddy. It actually broke the record of the longest cyclone um, in history, an all recorded history of cyclones with 35 days. Um, and it actually hit Mozambique uh, twice, in 24th of February and the 11th of March. Very unfortunate uh, for Freddy Cyclone, it chose very vulnerable areas to make its first and its second uh, landfall in Mozambican territory. We of often uh, refer to them as Freddy the first and Freddy the second um, in, um, in Mozambique. Um, so uh, even right now, as we speak, we still have 1.1 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, 123,000 people in evacuation center, and around 132,000 homes that have been totally or partially destroyed. So how have we supported as protection cluster? And I'm really looking here from the perspective of a coordinator of a protection cluster, right? I will also share with you the full plan in the text message as soon as I, I stop the, the presentation so that you can also appreciate uh, the entirety of the plan. But I will focus on some of the examples um, on how we've ensured protection mainstreaming and integration within the preparedness uh, phase. So I think key, of course, has been to work with uh, national authorities and the lead agency in Mozambique is the National Institute for Disaster Risk Management, the INGD, from its Portuguese acronym. And INGD has really come a long way from um, IDAI cycle. They've learned a lot from that experience in 2019. What is really what we've seen to be a gap um, in the previous uh, responses in 2020, 21, and last year, 2022, has been really uh, that mainstreaming of protection, right? Graham was mentioning the importance of looking at uh, persons with specific needs, persons with, with disabilities, those who cannot, do not have the luxury of fleeing, of displacing themselves to a safer area during cyclone. And this is what we've been trying to, um, to do together with the INGD. So one element of it, this, of course, is participating in their contingency planning processes, right? So we've, um, at the provincial level, the most um, 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 exposed provinces, we've reviewed the plans together with the, with the INGD and found opportunities through participatory workshops to integrate elements of gender, of inclusion of personal disabilities, AAP, and of course, a community engagement. At the national level, now at the more strategic level, we've actually signed a partnership uh, through uh, UNHCR, the Cluster Lead Agency, on providing capacity building uh, to the IGD. And this is where the role of the cluster uh, really plays, plays an added value, right? Because we don't only bring our know-how as UNHCR, but as a coordinator, I'm able to bring then, for example, UNICEF on issues of child protection, UNFPA on issues of GBV, uh, Save the Children Care, um, Oxfam, just to mention a, a few of the partners that have been supporting us on the ground. Um, strengthening local disaster risk reduction committees. So Mozambique has quite a very good network at the community level of these uh, community level committees that prepare communities for uh, disasters and especially in this context, uh, cyclones. Um, so what we've done <coughs> was a pilot workshop uh, last year in Sofala where we did evacuation simulations together with uh, protection cluster partners. And we would pause the simulation as they were going and uh, propose improvements in those simulations. Uh, for example, evacuations, how do you take into consideration persons with disabilities on transmitting messages? How do you take into consideration persons that cannot hear, for example? So it was a very practical, 
I must say it was very fun as well. You know, we, we met these heroes um, on the ground that are really working with their communities. And it was really a dialogue between, you know, protection cluster partners and the community. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, yeah. So um, also what we've done on the preparedness level is develop a number of what we call tools, right? Uh, but these are, of course, let's call them SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, and I'll highlight three of them. The first one that you see there on the right is the protection early warning messages. As you know, there's a commitment worldwide to for early warning messages to reach everyone. However, it's not often spoken about what is included in these early warning messages. Um, during the Gombe cyclone of last year, the authorities turned to us for uh, look any messages you would want to share with the community, and this really was for us an opportunity of developing these messages uh, for uh, the authorities. Things like, for example, prepare a run bag where you would include your civil documentation, right? We found that many have been losing their civil documentation during evacuations, and then they are unable to access a serious a series of services. Things like avoid sep being separated from your family during the cyclone landfall, right? Make sure you are together. Make sure you coach your children on where to um, reunite in case you get separated. Make sure your um, the persons with specific needs in your family are evacuated uh, first. Um, and these messages were used at the radio, also text messages, and they were transmitted by the local uh, uh, committees that, that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and we were actually very happy to see um, before the landfall of uh, Freddie, <laughs> Freddie the first, those names are a bit silly, but Freddie the first that the evacuation centers actually had, for example, the elderly person with disabilities evacuated first um, as, as, as an impact. Uh, the next slide, please. Graham, you might need to click a number of times because there are some bubbles there. Yeah, the next uh, guidance document that you see there is the uh, a guide for protection mainstream of those managing evacuation centers. Um, what, what happens in Mozambique when a cyclone hits is that the air that gets impacted which, as you can imagine, in this long coast is not easy to predict. Um, the schools in that area becomes evacuation centers. So that school director, that school teacher, um, who was enjoying his or her job as a um, in the education department, all of, all of a sudden has to manage for a week or two or three or four, as you've seen in other situations, a fully fledged uh, displaced camp um, with, evac with evacuated persons. So we've created this guide that provides them with guidance on how to mobilize community um, for for those um, volunteers to identify person specific needs, prioritize them for assistance, to make sure that unaccompanied separated minors are swiftly identified, to make sure that toilets are well separated between men and women, that toilets are well lit, that the bathing areas are not in dangerous places, that there's a security perimeter, all that protection really 101 stuff that really becomes um, important for protection risk mitigating um, on the ground. Uh, next, please, Graham. Or is it Nancy? Sorry. Um, I think one thing that we also do is, you know, basic protection cluster coordination um, activity. So these are the referral pathways, for example, for Sofala province, um, which of course is your bread and butter of protection cluster work. But what we've done this time around is that we've included, there you see in green uh, the box of the emergency focal points of the INGD. The INGD has these uh, district level focal points. If we, if we've included the name of the district and the name of the responsible focal point um, and their phone number. So for example, if you needed to be evacuated, if you needed to be, um, if you needed search and rescue to come in your um, area, 
you would have those um, those phone numbers. Um, th this, of course, and also includes all the other uh, protection services that you normally see in a humanitarian response, psychosocial support, uh, pro uh, pro child protection, GBV, and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. So uh, very, very briefly on the response phase, um, and again, this is, I would say, an added value of the protection cluster. Um, we try to then, of course, ensure a protection by presence in the different um, evacuation centers where we provide, let's say, a crash course on those, um, on those very same messages I was speaking about earlier, those tips on how to reduce protection risk in evacuation centers. So we we go to these evacuation centers, we meet with the managers of these centers, and we and we pretty much go through a crash course, right? It takes a, a, an hour of a we also walk around the, the center to see what can be improved um, based on, on the list. And we also ensure that partners are visiting those centers on a regular basis to refer um, people with uh, specific needs to um, specialized service. The next slide, please. PSTA, of course, um, it, it is always a risk and the initial or SCA rather sexual exploitation and abuse is a huge risk in the initial phase of the response. And we also work very closely with the PSCA network of the UN to ensure that populations are, uh, um, are made aware, right, of the various complaint and feedback mechanisms. In, in Mozambique, we have a, a hotline and, in, um, and also that humanitarian aid is free um, and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Nancy. Um, I will actually ask you to go to the next one. So this is an example also of um, what we produce together with partners. So the partners that are regularly visiting these evacuation centers, we have them also input their findings in a Kobo and where you have the different evacuation centers mapped and the different risk levels for each uh, protection topic. So for example, is GBV a risk in this center? Is child protection a risk in this other center? Is PSA a risk um, in, 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 in which centers? And this map gets then shared with authorities because they very quickly look to um, close accommodation evacuation centers as the populations start to return and um, how to say, uh, concentrate them in accommodation center. So they've often used this tool um, to then um, see which of the accommodation centers are better equipped for hosting populations for um, a larger um, um, period of time. Uh, next, please. And I actually, I wanted to put some images just, just to give you an impression of what we see on the ground, but I'll ask you just to go next. These are very simply some very, what we call quick protection fixes. Uh, thanks to our presence on the ground, we ensure of course that toilet bathing areas are well lit and separated by gender. We identify where there's specific issues with other sectors, for example, food security, and we um, in, um, increase capacities of, of kitchen and of course the, the, the um, activities for the kids who might stay longer um, term in evacuation center. But these are just some very um, illustrative examples. The next slide. And we also, um, as protection will support the nature, we support in visiting areas of origin and areas of resettlement. Right, to ensure that the correct um, sphere standards are in resettlement, what, what they call in Mozambique resettlement sites. I think internally in UNHCR we agree they're more relocation sites um, and we provide of course guidance uh, to the authorities on those as well. Uh, and the next and final slide. And I think very importantly, um, a bit what Sam was mentioning in the opening, when you think of um, disasters, right, um, you're quick to think of shelter, you're quick to think of food, 
um, but protection often gets overlooked, right? The protection risk oft, often gets overlooked. So reporting and communicating those uh, protection risks is, all, is something that we've, we, we do also um, during emergencies. We've been uh, producing reports on a weekly basis in the first the weeks of the Cyclone Freddy emergency, really to communicate the various uh, risks being observed on the ground. Of course, not only for awareness and advocacy, but um, no secret here, also for fundraising, for our partners to be um, to be able to scale up and respond on the ground. Because a lot of the coordination we do in the first few weeks is really risk mitigating, but at some point we really look to our partners to scale up and be able to respond. And um, it, it has been quite a challenge to be able to, of course, um, fundraise um, on the importance of protection within those uh, few weeks. But things such as, for example, the guidance that has been produced by the GPC has really supported us and placed protection at the center of um, cyclone response. So that's it from my end. Back to you, Graham and Nancy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Hugo. That was very helpful and a really good insight into how you're preparing from the cluster side in Mozambique. So now um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Salma Abdelahai. She's the Protection Cluster Co-Coordinator in South Sudan. Salma Abdelahai is an experienced Protection Cluster Co-Coordinator who's currently based in Juba, South Sudan, with over five years of expertise in protection programming and force displacement issues in the East and Horn of Africa regions. She's developed particular skills in providing technical program learning, capacity development, and coordination support in the implementation of durable solutions programs. Salman's focus has been on working with consortia to support displacement affected populations in Somalia and Ethiopia. Her in-depth knowledge of these regions and her ability to provide technical support has been essential in the implementation of effective programs for those affected by displacement. Over to you, Salma, thanks. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Nancy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So today's uh, presentation is uh, just slightly going to touch on the impact of uh, climate change. As you all know, South Sudan is experiencing a multi-dimensional uh, crisis, and this is as well as the social, economical, the public health uh, crisis, security and political instability, and how climate change is already exacerbating these uh, issues that we are experiencing within the, the country. Next slide, please. With uh, that said, as you can see, currently in uh, South Sudan, we have an estimated 2.2 million people who have uh, remained uh, displaced by conflict as well as uh, natural uh, disasters. Um, in 2022, we had an estimated 1 million uh, people who were severely impacted by the flooding. And this was across the 32 uh, counties across the, the country, essentially making South Sudan the top 10 uh, countries that are easily most vulnerable to uh, climate uh, change. When we look at uh, also additional tracking tools just to also support uh, this data on um, the IOM uh, displacement tracking uh, matrix also indicates that 29% of displacement have happened because of disaster. Of course, we do acknowledge with the total of displacement that we have within the country is not only attributed to uh, climate change. The protection cluster also launched its uh, protection monitoring system uh, last year, October 20. 22. And it also collects information around displacement and the reasons why displacement is taking place. As you can see, 34% of the key informants that were interviewed reported that communities did experience restriction of movement due to flooding, as well as 45% reported destruction of property happening uh, because of flooding. And of course, with the restrictions, this is placing the community, especially women and girls, at uh, more uh, vulnerable, uh, increases their vulnerability. When it comes to the increased uh, flooding, um, two-thirds of the country has experienced flooding. 
So this uh, also indicates the, the fact that the, the flooding has heavily interrupted uh, the livelihood activities of the country and has exacerbated or aggravated the already alarming levels of food insecurity that we are currently see seeing in the country. So it's been uh, recorded or an estimated 16,500 hectares of cropland have uh, potentially been affected by the, the flood waters. And before I move on to the next slide, uh, floods in 2020 and early 2022 were so severe that the waters did not fully reside. So any little rainfall that we received was causing huge uh, damage as well as um, just covering the, the farmlands uh, that um, we have both of some of the eastern as well as the western equatorium. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at uh, climate change and the uh, impact it has on protection and food insecurity and displacement, I mean, Sam and Hugo have rightly mentioned the the flood impact, it does exacerbate the protection risk or situation that women and girls, especially also persons with disability and the elderly. So women and girls are placed in a vulnerable position because they do unfortunately experience multiple displacement, not only due to flooding, but also to conflict. And this severely weakens or impacts their coping mechanisms and resilience. And this is further, you know, made uh, it weakened by the fact that women and girls lack access to assets. Early marriage impacts the education of girls, again, puts them in more vulnerable situation, timid headed households. During the flooding uh, season, we do see high uh, rates of unaccompanied and separated uh, children uh, that are coming to the centers, family separation, and also persons with uh, special needs and elderly persons that are being uh, left behind in terms of when flooding does happen because they do not have the means uh, to move uh, or the, the resources. So when we're talking also in terms of the livelihood uh, impact and the food insecurity, as I mentioned, in South Sudan, we do have that multi-dimensional crisis that we are facing. And this just in general does exacerbate the protection uh, situation that we are currently seeing. The droughts and floods have affected the food security and livelihood uh, in the country. So according to the latest integrated food security phase uh, classification, the IPC, about 7.7 .7 million, almost, this is almost two thirds of the total population, is facing an IPC3 uh, crisis. And when the flooding happened, this is also worsened by the fact that nutrition centers were heavily impacted by the flood waters and uh, estimated 121 nutrition centers are inaccessible. And again, this is increasing the vulnerability of the children and pregnant and lactating uh, women. As you can see, we've also included a point on the contamination and explosive audits. This is one point that the one of the area of the mine action area of responsibility, uh, with of course the support of the protection cluster, is uh, advocating for additional resources. Because now that we have seen unprecedented and consecutive floodings uh, ongoing in the country, mine action activities have considerably slowed down. During floodings, uh, clearance cannot be done or mine uh, education, uh, risk education cannot be done in some of the locations because the areas are inaccessible. Um, and when we're also just talking about the food insecurity and interlinkages with the climate change, for example, in Jongole, which is on the north, and Unity, that is in the northwest, is facing an IPC5. And important to note that these two states were the most impacted uh, by, the, by the floodings that we've seen for the past uh, four, four years. So when we're talking about the floods and displacement, again, four years of uh, unprecedented floods have led to massive displacement. I did mention in the previous uh, slide that one uh, million people were directly impacted by the flooding, and these numbers were verified on uh, as of October 2028. 20, uh, um, so this has also had a huge impact on the mobility and migration. Um, in terms of the livestock herders uh, being uh, forced to migrate along new routes, and this is mostly towards the equatorias and these areas, the western and e eastern equatorial of South Sudan, were not um, 
so so much impacted by the flood, and we've seen tensions and conflict um, increase between the cattle herders as well as the farmers. One key note uh, on this side is, of course, uh, September 9th last year, the government did declare the flood response uh, preparedness plans. So the plans were developed for 10 states and the response did commence uh, and they are ongoing. But because of the insecurity and violence against aid workers, access constraints, they did hamper the overall, uh, you know, response of the of the flood response. In 2022, we had nine aid workers that were killed, and almost 420 incidents were reported. This includes burning and looting of the humanitarian assets, which is considered uh, slowing down the the response and. In 2023, five um, aid workers were already lost um, their lives. The next slide, please. So on this slide, I'm just going to quickly touch on the impact of conflict as well as the political dynamics and as well as just touch on the policies. So climate change can exacerbate the communal and ethnic conflicts that we are currently seeing. As I've mentioned, we have seen increased tensions and conflicts between the cattle herders as well as the farmers. Um, we do have the IDP Act 2019. This has not been endorsed by the government yet. Of course, this does increase the vulnerability of the IDPs due to the lack, again, of accountability and ownership by the government. Um, the IDP Act does look at the dom domestication of two key documents, and this is the Kampala Convention, as well as the guiding principles, and looks at displacement not only caused by armed conflicts, but also human rights violations, as well as the adverse effects of uh, climate change. Um, at, on, on all, all um, its phases. So basically looking at the prevention, protection, as well as assistance uh, during displacement, and also does heavily touch on the durable solutions uh, programming in regards to uh, the bill highlights the importance of the whole of government and the whole of society approach. Uh, but because um, the act has not been um, endorsed or adopted by the government. This does have the implication on the slow implementation of also the revitalized agreement uh, by the government. So when we talk about this is uh, just the impact that the displacement in turn has on the conflict dynamics is amplified where political instability and poor governance undermines the climate resilience um, impedes the humanitarian support as well as uh, paves way for more communal friction. Because also important to uh, note the power dynamics that we are also seeing. The dominant groups are from the pastoral communities. And this, again, does play into the power dynamics that we're seeing and the kind of support each group is getting uh, from the government and essentially just exacerbating those tensions uh, within, within, within the, on, the, on the ground. Um, next slide, please. So how is the protection? I mean, we are not as advanced as uh, Mozambique, but hopefully we will get there soon. Uh, congratulations to Hugo and the team. So in terms of how the protection cluster is uh, responding, so one of the main things that we do is ensuring that we proposition all the supplies that we need during the dry season. Um, even though in March, which is usually the dry season, we still experience um, heavy uh, floodings. Um, so we ensure the dignity kits that are needed in all the main field offices are, are there. The protection cluster also has a standard flood uh, response package. So this includes immediate prevention and response activities that are tailored toward reducing uh, protection risk, gender-based violence, or so looking at our GBV, sorry. GBV colleagues setting up a women friendly spaces, child friendly spaces. We set up um, a protection help desk not only to serve the protection partners, but also non protection partners. Also in the standard flood response, we do have also protection mainstreaming in terms of just the key highlights um, that other clusters need to be mindful of. 
Um, we also ensure that we do have protection monitoring and uh, identification of those protection risks that are related to the floods. And one thing that we've done, like we've said, because of the flooding, the roads are majorly inaccessible. So we do run static responses, but majorly due to also funding gaps and resources, we have shifted to mobile response and mostly with the support of UNHCR doing the uh, response through uh, by using boat and reaching those uh, communities that have been exclude, uh, completely cut off uh, from everybody and uh, of course delivering core relief um, items. On the last one, um, in 2023, this year, South Sudan is expected to receive additional funding for anti-famine response. So the reason why we also included this point here is that in, in this response, protection was not prioritized. So of course, the guidance was really useful for us. And of course, we reached out to the GPC colleagues kind of to support us with those advocacy uh, messages, uh, but also the the rationale that was being used was because protection mainstreaming is there, then core protection programming is not needed. This is also a narrative that as protection actors that we need to push um, against. Protection mainstreaming, of course, is a safe programming, it's needed, but then does not replace the core uh, protection program uh, that is needed to make sure that the people who need uh, those services uh, can, can be provided. So this is really something that we're pushing and fighting on a daily uh, basis. Uh, so essentially this is a, in a nutshell what we are doing uh, as a cluster. And of course, with the support of GPC, we are looking into developing advocacy notes just to position ourselves better in terms of when it comes to how the protection cluster can strengthen its response when it comes to uh, climate change um, in South Sudan. And especially now that the conversation is heading towards uh, durable solutions uh, programming. So this is it from my end. My network was a bit unstable. I do hope I was clear, but um, over to you, Nancy and Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Salma. That was a very good overview of, the, of how you're responding in terms of the protection cluster in South Sudan. So now we're gonna turn to the section on question and answers where people online and in the room will have the opportunity to ask questions. And our moderator for the session is Christine Apio. Uh, Christine Apio has served for over 14 years in different capacities in humanitarian settings, including in acute and protracted displacement contexts with different organizations, including IRC, Care International, Global Communities, UNFPA, among others. Her experience cuts across GBV, i.e. program development and management, interagency GBV coordination, research and advocacy, GBV, i.e. capacity development. Her work spans across the East and Horn of Africa in Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and South Sudan, the Middle East and North Africa, the West and Central African region, Nigeria, and DRC. She currently oversees GBV and emergencies preparedness, prevention, and inclusion work streams with the GBV AOR in East and Southern Africa, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Without further ado, over to you, Christine. Um, thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't see any question on the chat, so perhaps I would request that if um, any participant has a question, you can raise up your hands and then uh, um, get off the mic and directly ask the question to the presenter. Otherwise, I do have um, also just a few, a few questions that I would pose. But maybe let's see um, if there yeah, are there's hands. a yeah, Christine. There's a question in the room. Okay, please. Yeah, go ahead. for disasters that might strike in the sort of upcoming months ahead uh, of time, which is really great. I think the protection angle is something that needs to be strengthened. How, uh, maybe for your speakers online as well, Mozambique, how are you preparing for 
more unprecedented extremes in new areas, for example, that haven't been affected by extremes in the past, like flooding uh, or cyclones, or uh, and also the sort of the, the longer term perspective. This is a lot of sort of short term uh, preparedness as well. Great, over to you, Graham. <laughs> yeah, perhaps um, just summarize your question for the online and for the translators. <clears throat> I, I missed your name, I'm sorry. The Slabo from the Climate Center, yeah. Who basically had a question around uh, noting that, you know, the information we provided, which was interesting, is very much around preparedness and a certain amount of response planning for very immediate events we're seeing now. But how do we position ourselves better for thinking around some of the unprecedented extremes and events that we're, we know are probably over the horizon, basically, and, and the longer term perspective? So that's the question. Maybe, Christine, I'll respond a little bit and then we can see if the other colleagues have got, got responses as well. I think it's a very good point. Um, I think in the in the guidance, we touch a little bit on the, we, 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 we emphasize the IPCC guidance, um, but there is a need, I agree, with kind of over the horizon planning. Increasingly, that's something that we're going to have to start doing much more of. I think the advantage we have is that as the modeling seems to be coming more accurate and you know the mapping and modeling is something that's ramping up then we should be in a better position to start having some of that information uh, available uh, but it is going to be important that we react to it you know as the humanitarian community i think um back to you uh, back to you christine i don't know whether you go or people have any responses thank you thank you uh, graham is there any question from participants online? All of those in the house, in the room. Kindly raise your hands. We have another question in the room. Over to you, please. Hi, uh, I'm from the World Health Organization. Just a question for uh, predominantly all of the speakers, really. In, and in taking on our unprecedented disasters and issues that come up, how has conceptually the issues of health impacted the way you think about protection for your populations? I, I, and I did appreciate, the, for example, the way South Sudan speaker mentioned whole society, you know, uh, engagement and planning. And I'm just wondering if you've seen that somehow impact how you approach conceptually what protection means. Uh, to the population you serve and to the issues you try to, to raise in the field. Great, thanks. Thanks, Aaron, from that from WHO. How has health um, how has health been integrated, right, in how protection actors approach the situation following a natural hazard? Building on the issue of yeah. unprecedented health or unprecedented disasters in the context. Okay. Building on the unprecedented disasters um, following a sort of health crisis. So, Christine, do you see any? Over to you, Christine, if you have any. See any other comments on any, that? Any comments from Salma or Hugo on that particular so, point? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, Hugo, do you want to go first, then Salma? Or maybe stop Salma first, um, whatever works best. They, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks, Salma gave a thumbs up. Um, no, maybe on the preparedness front and, and looking at more long term, I, I think, you know, um, what, what we're trying to do here is really think outside of our small group of, of humanitarian partners and really looking at strengthening the authorities, right, both at the national level as I mentioned, uh, the creation of this safeguarding division within the INGD um, has been very instrumental for us to, 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 to build capacity of these agencies that will be here long um, after we are gone, and also of communities. And maybe just an, a point that I should add is also um, population movements by the authority, either relocating or are um, returning them. We've also done some work around um, ensuring that these are done with protection um, safeguardings in mind, right? Have your populations been consulted? Do they even want to 
be um, relocated or return? Um, have you included the impacted population in organizing those movements and so forth? And and we really make a lot of we make big cases out of even small movements. For example, when an evacuation center is being closed and populations are being moved uh, back to an area that is right nearby, because we hope this can also shape, you know, the practices moving forward. This is a country that unfortunately a lot of its coast will be heavily impacted by rising sea levels. Um, and we really want the authorities to think of their resettlement or relocation plans in a, in a, a more human rights uh, and protection uh, um, lens. Um, on the on the health, um, I think maybe what what we've seen a lot here is, uh, and, and this especially this um, uh, this season is the cholera. You know, um, the Freddie, the second landfall of Freddie, has definitely exacerbated uh, cholera, and this has complicated a lot of the response. Right, the pop for example, the authorities not one thing the populations to stay long in evacuation centers, even though they had nowhere to go back. Um, so we really had to uh, adapt our our messaging around that uh, around that issue. And also cholera um, in, in the country, um, uh, Mozambique has created a lot of, of tensions there, you know, beliefs that humanitarians are bringing cholera, that the Red Cross was bringing cholera. Um, and so it, it has complicated um, the response of humanitarian partners. So we've had to mitigate messaging and our approaches uh, around that. I hope that answers over back to you um, um, and maybe to Salma. Thank you, Ugo. Salma, over to you. No, yeah, thank you uh, very much. I mean, yes, with the with the flooding, we have seen uh, increased uh, outbreak in uh, diseases because the wells or water points are contaminated. And of course, when the conflict have um, uh, erupted, some of the wells were also destroyed by uh, the people who were attacking some of the uh, other villages. I mean, when it comes to also how as protection we we interlink, we do have the mobile uh, response. So this year we do have the integrated uh, mobile response approach where we also have those key messages about um, the health, the prevention, what people can do is also incorporated into our key messages. As a protection cluster, we have also been um, at the forefront when it also comes to the access to self uh, safe health care at risk because in South Sudan, as I've mentioned, um, aid workers as well as health workers and health centers um, are looted, attacked, damaged, whether it's by flooding or also attacked during a conflict. So and because funding is also going down, we also have to come up with different modalities that we can closely uh, collaborate. So what I would say from the protection uh, part, the health cluster, yes, does uh, support us with the the the, the um, post-rep uh, kit treatments, which WHO supports us with, which is greatly appreciated. But then also we make sure we collaborate with them when we are deploying our response teams just to make sure those uh, key messages are are captured into also the awareness raising we are doing within this isolated communities by the floodings. Uh, uh, thank you, Salma. Maybe I could make. Questions? Could I maybe make a couple of points, Christian? So it's, uh, uh, this is Graham. I think I think on on issues related to some of the health related factors. I think there is also this longer term. Uh, which I, I presume is what you're raising, is that we are starting to see with climate change, we're starting to see disease profiles emerge, you know, new diseases emerging, or well, not new, old diseases getting a foot on. I'm thinking of things like highland malaria outbreaks with rising temperatures, which I know we've seen, seen in East Africa, but also even uh, some of the recent mapping I saw was mapping even Ebola epidemics and outbreaks to periods of very high rainfall. I just wonder if if, if some of the issues that maybe protection actors working with health colleagues may be able to bring to the table is the importance of being able to work with communities and communicate with communities together, looking at what appropriate messaging is in terms of preparedness and prevention. 
I mean, I think it's some of the lessons coming out of the West Africa Ebola epidemic, which was very much focused on some of the lessons around getting the technical response right, but also making sure that we get the community and kind of anthropological mm -hmm. response correct. And I wonder if that's an area where, you know, particularly protection staff working with health staff perhaps have quite a lot to offer uh, thinking, thinking about the future as well. Sorry, back to you, Christine. I think Christine. Okay, I'm back. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, Can you're you back. Yeah, Thank over you. to you. Thank you. Before we go to the two questions um, online, I just wanted to quickly add that one of the biggest challenges we had um, in Thousand Malawi last year following the tropical storm Hana was the lack of um, post rep care kits available in health facilities in the affected districts in the south. Of course, being um, a non-cluster country, it's also um, definitely grappling challenges with uh, uh, underfunding. So um, one of the issues, uh, the thing we have been pushing for was to, uh, to pursue advocacy with the government to ensure that post rape care drugs are actually part of the, um, the government, the drug protocol that needs to be procured by the government. And I think this is something that WHO uh, could actually help push, especially in uh, countries that, that uh, do not have formally activated clusters, yet we know experiences um, cyclical um, natural hazards on a yearly basis. Um, moving forward, we have two questions um, from uh, online participants. Uh, the first question is from Mahaira Farouk, I hope I've pronounced your name well. Um, the first question is, what role do protection actors play in addressing the impact of climate change? Uh, two, um, how was the, the guidance and toolkit developed and what are the key components? And I think Graham uh, spoke a bit during his presentation about the, uh, the component and the toolkit so uh, Graham, I don't know uh, whether you would want to take over that. And then the first question maybe could go to Ugo and Salma, either Ugo or, or Salma or both. Over to you. Role of uh, protection actors in addressing the impact of climate change. Yes. Does um, any of you I want to respond? Yes, Ugo. Uh, no, uh, yes. I mean, I mean, the, the impact of of cyclone, as we were discussing. I mean, for for example, some of the activities, right? When I think of of my role as protection as a coordinator, I think of my partners and the activities they are doing. So, for example, we've been, we've created uh, protection committees and relocation sites that are receiving. Um, a lot of these populations that have been displaced by cyclones along the different uh, years. Um, the uh, early warning systems that we were talking about, of course, a lot of our partners are renewing civil documentation. This has been a very important activity by protection partners uh, because many have lost their civil documentation during the cyclone, which then complicates it, complicates their very access to humanitarian support. Um, Another one, of course, is MHPSS. You know, cyclone die haven't been so terrible. Any small wins that you see creates a lot of anxiety in the population. So PSS has been very important. Support to persons with disabilities with assistive devices, for example, communication with communities, activities, MHPSS activities for, for children in evacuation centers and relocation areas, and so on and so forth. Family tracing, obviously. Um, and we hope to have soon partners doing more on cash, for example, uh, for uh, protection. I hope um, I hope I answered that one. Back to you. Thank you, Hugo. Salma, do you have anything to add? From uh, yes, South just Sudan uh, maybe, yes. Thank you, uh, Christine. Maybe on South Sudan, what I would say in terms of the what the protection cluster actors uh, and also the protection cluster has supported with as i said of course is that available analysis we did launch the protection monitoring system and one of the uh, protection issues that we track um, is also the 
the reasons why displacement happens, and we do collect information around restriction of movement, uh, destruction of property, as well as uh, documentation. So apart from this, because we do deploy mobile uh, response uh, teams, sometimes we are in a good position where we have access to locations where our other colleagues might not have. So we do release uh, flash uh, reports, uh, do those presentation and alerts at the ICCG, and we basically put ourselves in a position where we've become an information hub. Um, our early warning system is still not perfect, but it has uh, sir, been very, very uh, useful since the towards the end of last year and beginning um, of this year. Uh, and I will definitely say the mobile uh, protection response has been a big uh, win for the cluster in terms of how we respond to the climate change and adapting our modality of response, especially with the funding uh, going down. Thank you, Christine, over to you. Thank you, Salma. Um, uh, Graham, do you want to just quickly in one minute, maybe summarize the question on uh, the GPC, the guide and the toolkit, how it was developed and the key components. Over to you, Graham. Yes, um, certainly. Um, I think the, the, the approach that was taken was very much to, to basically base it on the express needs and views of the, of the field protection clusters, uh, as well as some consultations with you know, with, with obviously experts at an international level. So that's why we, as, as I did briefly mention, we particularly had a series of calls with the field protection clusters, which involved, you know, from, you know, across the different regions, which involved large numbers of people, obviously people at an agency level, but also quite But we did consult with quite a lot of community-based organisations, so that the, what's in the guidance really reflects the kind of topics and content that they stressed. With again, with this emphasis on practicality and not reinventing the wheel, and also recognising that there is broader guidance out there on on issues related to DRR. So that's why we ended up trying to focus on protection-related issues. Thank you, Graham. Uh, perhaps the next question from Natasia Zulino uh, will probably go to either Ugo or, Sal or Salma. Uh, the question is whether any of the clusters or protection actors have worked with national civil protection organizations and or IFRC in terms of uh, climate change and protection. Over to you, um, Ugo or Salma. Or both of you, if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, from from South Sudan, yes, we unfortunately we haven't had a close collaboration with the IFRC, but yes, we've had a close collaboration, working relationship with the civil protection agencies. And again, this has been majorly through our mobile uh, response uh, team. I think also this pushes towards the localization uh, agenda that we're also looking at, even though here in South Sudan, this conversation is picking up uh, right now. And the terminologies we haven't fully agreed on when we say localization, exactly what it means and who we need to uh, empower, unfortunately. But yes, yeah, so these are the agencies that we work with, but not so much with um, I. IFRC. Thank you. Ugo, would you like to add something? Yes, no, no on our side, I mean, um, the, 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 as you know, the shelter and five cluster during uh, climate uh, shocks is coordinated by the IFRC. The IFRC has deployed uh, colleagues for those specific um, seasons. So we've worked close in the sense of ensuring that their shelter response, of course, um, is, is, is observing and, and making protection. I think also what should be added here is that one of the main responders in Mozambique is the Mozambican uh, Red Cross. And so we've included uh, them in these exercises that I've mentioned. For example, the simulation, um, these evacuation simulations, um, we've included the, the, the Mozambican Red Cross and also in some of our, our regional uh, workshops. Uh, back to you, Apil. Thank you, Ugo. Uh, then we have, I hope that answers your question, Natalie. Uh, the next question is from Matt. And um, 
it's the first one is around partnerships and collaboration in terms of how can partnership and collaboration be leveraged to address the impact of climate change on protection for example in south sudan or mozambique and then i think the next question probably would go to graham after publishing the toolkit and guidance, what are the next steps for GPC to address climate change and protection risk? So perhaps we can start with uh, Salma and uh, then go to Ugo on partnership and collaboration. Over to you, Salma. Um, yes, uh, thank you. So, in terms of uh, ex exactly what the protection cluster is doing when it comes to partnership and collaboration, again, through our GBV area of responsibility, we have strengthened uh, the capacity as well as information sharing with the women-led organizations. This, uh, the colleagues on the ground mostly are our first uh, frontline responders when it comes to uh, any disaster. So this has been advocating uh, for them to be getting the, the resources um, that they need, as well as information sharing and, of course, uh, capacity uh, development. The other capacity development and leverage that we've used as a cluster, I would say, is with our other clusters, um, with the WASH, um, the health, as well as the shelter clusters, because sometimes because of the resources or the funding that they receive, they do have more coverage than us. So when assessments or activities are being carried out, we tend to tag along in those missions. And this actually really has helped us to uh, reach to areas that we will not necessarily have. I think the other collaboration that we leveraged on has been with UNMIS. At the field level, we do have a very strong collaboration with our UNMIS colleagues. Um, this is in terms, of course, we cannot do patrols, but through our early warning system or the flaggings, this is flagged to UNMIS, for example, in Malakal, where we pose a request of uh, patrol in some of the locations and uh, with many thanks to UNMIS colleagues have responded. So these are just few of the people or agencies or clusters that we do collaborate, again, because of the, the funding um, shortages that we do experience. So we want to see where we can just uh, pick it back on to just expand um, our reach uh, to the communities we might not necessarily be reaching. But over to uh, you. Thank you, thank you. Salma. Uh, I just wanted before proceeding, I know we're supposed to end the session at 4.30, but also consider, considering we started a bit late, I'm wondering whether we could stay a bit for just 10 minutes to um, enable us uh, presenters address the last remaining questions and then uh, the conclusion, concluding remarks. Maybe Christine, be, because... Be okay. Yeah. yeah, maybe for maybe another five minutes, um, if that's okay. Um, if it if needed, yeah, ten minutes for Hugo and Salma and Graham to answer any further questions. So over to you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Ugo, how about you? Thank you, Apiono. So I think um, I mentioned the partnership with the National Institute of Disaster Risk Reduction, but I, I would say this is really the um, added value of the protection cluster in a in a response. I think some have mentioned very well the low funding um, in our operations, right? It's really uh, through the through these partners that are on the ground that we can uh, maximize the response. For example, in Mozambique being this very long uh, country, there's some districts uh, or some provinces rather where you where you have very few uh, partners, but you do have, for example, some um, NGO partners such as Care, World Vision, Save the Children, to name a few, uh, working on development issues. So we've been re we've been really been able to rely on those partners to be able to pass uh, uh, to participate in in protection monitoring response and communicate the needs back to us if you weren't able to be uh, on the ground. Also, for example, we have FAMOD, which is a association of persons with a, a forum of associations of persons with disabilities in Mozambique, that's a mouthful, and they are present throughout uh, the territory. And we've really relied on them um, as well. Um, and yeah, again, for capacity building, this is really where we can bring, you know, UNICEF for child protection, UNFPA for GBV, 
FAMOD for persons with disabilities, um, a cluster uh, approach really can maximize um, capacity building. Uh, back to you, Apio. Uh, thank you, Ugo. Before I hand over to Gra um, uh, Ugo, um, I, I participated at the, the annual Southern Africa Development Community uh, um, meeting in March. And uh, they announced that the, uh, the SADAC Humanitarian and Operations Center in Mozambique, together with IFRC, will be developing an integrated um, regional uh, uh, early warning systems. So I'm wondering whether uh, that there could be opening for the global protection cluster to leverage on such to ensure mainstreaming of protection, gender, and other issues. Yes, Apio, you are you are spot on. This is an initiative they were very much aware. Um, Mozambique has positioned itself as a leader in, in DRR. The president is the, of Mozambique is, is, has been called the champion of DRR in the African Union. So they're really positioning themselves. And this uh, SADEC um, early warning uh, system in the city of Nakala, we're very much aware of it and exploring uh, different uh, entry points on, on how to support them. On, on protection mainstream and integration. And we're actually using the experience that I've been mentioning uh, to, to, to showcase what we can do and, and, and um, explore um, how, to, how to proceed. It, it's, very, it's very much at the initial stages. Uh, even on the ground, there's, there's no center yet. It's, it's still uh, to be built, but very much for that. Thank you very much for that. Yes, we are, it's on our radar. Thank you, Uga. Um... Now over to you, Graham, for the um, question on next steps for the GPC to address climate change and protection risk. OK, thank you. I'll be very brief because I think this is an issue Nancy will also touch on in her closing remarks in, in a minute or two. But just to say that in terms of what we've already done or what the GPC's already done, the, the you know, we've had a series of we, we've had a series of online events um this being one of them but we've had actual events with the with the clusters with some of the field clusters colleagues online we've also had two face-to-face -face events one in nairobi and one in amman in jordan um so we we've, we've been rolling out that way but i mean you know this is an ongoing issue uh, it's one thing having guidance as we know uh, another thing if it sits in either an electronic or virtual folder so so this is why i think it's important to have events look such as this to kind of get people talking and to get people using. But I think Nancy will say a little more about future plans in a minute or two. Thank you, Graham. And um, um, over to you, Nancy. Yeah, thanks, Christine. If there are no more questions, I think we can wrap up now. Um, thanks so much, Christine, for moderating that, that, that section of our question and answers. So just just to say thanks so much to everyone. Um, I think what we've learned today, we've spent a lot of time highlighting the impacts of climate change and disasters, and that fact that it's still increasing in frequency as well as severity, as you've seen in, in many countries, uh, whether it's in uh, the Northwest Syria or in Syria, and various operations in countries in, in East and Horn of Africa and Southern Africa. In terms of protection risk, we've seen that these two are often multiple and complex and further emphasize that we as protection actors need to be central to climate change, disaster preparedness and response. In terms of the impact we've seen with hazards and the lessons learned from elsewhere, including preparedness and response, we, we still need to work closely with our partners and understand more on, with our local partners, the women-led organizations that Salma mentioned, the protection committees that, uh, that uh, Hugo mentioned in Mozambique, and understand their capacities and their challenges and that the localization agenda is really key to the work that we're doing. We also saw and heard today from, uh, from both Hugo and Salma, um, as well as Graham, that the importance of work across the humanitarian development peace nexus is important. Um, it's not just the work that we are seeing on climate change by the protection cluster, but the need for strengthen institutions, communities and flexible responses in order to, to in, respond and to prepare with the challenges that we have in front of us. Some of our colleagues already that we've referenced involved in disaster reduction and resilience have of course been doing important work on these issues for a number of years and have made really key contributions to this work. Uh, 
We hope that our GPC guidance and toolkit that we prepared and you see here in, in the room and online um, will help those working on protection issues to ensure that these are included in the context in our work, whether in GBV, uh, SEA and other issues and protection risks and challenges that both Hugo and Salma highlighted in both their cluster operations. We've seen these examples today across the clusters and we hope to take these issues forward and continue to work with that. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you in the room and in, online that have come uh, and participated in our webinar, our online event, and have had the chance to look at our guidance and our toolkit. Um, I'd like to encourage you to continue to use this in your work. Um, and also we will post this in the chat and we can share it. Um, you can look for it in our Global Protection Cluster website. It's our intention um, that this guidance will be responsive to and adapt to the needs as we've seen fit. So it's constantly evolving. And as, as the question asks, we're gonna continue to roll out our guidance and toolkit, both in the Americas regions as, as well as the Francophone regions uh, for the clusters that we cover and hope to continue to work with the partners uh, on the ground. And I also wanna thank our colleagues, Tim, Humaira, Marie, mm -hmm. and Emma, of course, Graham, who's been essential for our guidance and our toolkit. And of course, uh, Hugo, Salma, Christine, thank you so much and all the colleagues online. Thanks and have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you.